So I'm going to talk about the way that we talk about free software legal tools. Oh, apparently we don't have that either. OK. Um, so uh, as many of you are probably aware, uh, Free software, open source has, has won, which is great, which means we have lots of uh, folks le using the software. But we haven't quite gotten as much buy-in on the tools. And so we see either like a complete blank slate or um, kind of using the tools in not the best way or not the way that we intended them to be used. Um, this is, uh, have people seen The Little Mermaid? Yeah, OK. So I read this story on Atlas Obscura about this woman who, uh, she looked at The Little Mermaid, and what she thought was, I have to get my friend, who's a nautical history expert, to watch this movie with me so I can see how much of what's going on in The Little Mermaid is accurate from the shipwreck scene. Uh, the, the spoiler is uh, not very much. <laughs> Right, um, And so uh, I fear that we're in a similar situation with free software legal tools. Like, uh, we haven't had a Disney movie about them yet. I, I keep my fingers crossed. But, um, but this is sort of the level of uh, you know, understanding that we have sometimes with these tools, which is uh, really unfortunate. So we spent a lot of time making them. Uh, so uh, my name is Deb Nicholson. I work at the Open Invention Network. So I often get the opportunity to talk to people about these things for the first time. They're like, oh, I figured we'd just leave all the legal stuff till like next year. And I'm like, wow, that is a stunningly bad idea. Um, don't do that. And so, uh, so I, I get to hear a lot of the result of what happens when we don't do a great job of messaging around the free software legal tools. If you want, you can tweet at me or you can email me. Um, I'll do that again at the end. So I see this as sort of a, a two-part challenge. Um, first, um, the way that we think about copyrights and patents is actually different. It really is different. Um, when you go out into the rest of the world, uh, pop property rights are pretty old. So a lot of our stuff around, especially copyright, but also patents, is based on legal code from property rights. In the US, you can shoot someone like for trespassing on your property. So like, think of all that as being baked into like, what are you doing with my things? And that's like baked into our legal code in the Western uh, parts of the world where we, you know, uh, well, I know you guys don't shoot people over here, but um, <laughs> not usually. That's, that's kind of our jam, I guess. Um, so uh, copyright is, is old enough. It's, uh, you know, we started using um, copyright as an international thing in 1886 when the Berne Convention was established. And, um, and that means there's a, lot of, there's a lot of case law in there that really like, holds this idea that, um, that written words should be considered you know, of a piece with cattle and land and pitchforks and all those kinds of things. So, um, so we're really going upstream when we're like, cool, borrow my cows, whatever. Uh, so it's. That's, that's one of our challenges in messaging the way that we talk about our tools. Um, another thing that kind of goes with that is that lawyers tend not to be early uh, adopters, present company accepted. Uh, but usually if it's like, oh, I didn't learn about that at all in law school, cool, I'll uh, try it out on my first legal job and see if I get fired. Um, that's not usually an animo for like, a successful lawyer. Um, and uh, finally, uh, do you guys know what this is from? Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's a, uh, a note about we're going to destroy your house that's being kept in the basement of a municipal building that's open on the third Thursday of every month. So a lot of our documentation tends to be like this. It's not like we haven't done a great job of telling lawyers that are not already here in this room where to look for uh, best practices and things like that. Once you're already in, you get invited to the secret cabal and all that kind of stuff, and that's great. But um, before you're in, you don't know where to look. So the second part of our challenge is that if we leave a vacuum for how we want free software legal tools to be perceived, uh, other parties will do our job for us. And they will do it poorly, like really poorly, stunningly poorly. Boring occasionally and maliciously. So we'll look at a couple of those um, entities that have sort of stepped up, so to speak. Um, so, uh, oh, you can't read this one very well. 
the compliance industrial complex, we talked about this last week and, or two weeks ago in Australia, and, um, and talked about it before. Their mantra is be afraid, be very, very afraid. Uh, of copy left and all of that free software that you're getting out on street corners and whatever. Um, they, the reason is, is that they, they want you to pay them to make all the scary stuff go away. This is not so different than um, if you look at those advertisings in the 50s for you know, stuff to make all the different parts of your body smell good. And they were really like fear-based. They were like, oh, why does no one like you at work? It's because you're not using this kind of stuff. And so it's a very old way of um, getting people to buy your product. So the, you see this also sometimes, this kind of attitude from people who are uh, vying for an inside counsel job. So they want to say like, oh, there's this huge danger over here. But luckily, I am an expert in the domain, and I can fix it for you. So this makes, uh, this makes them sort of against our message, which is that we're producing a bunch of scary um, gotcha sort of software. Uh, another thing, um, trial lawyers. I read a couple of these like trial lawyer blogs. If you guys are not familiar, this is um, the Rococo art period, which is like, you can see there's like ruffles on the ruffles and flowers on the flowers. It's a very like, you know, there is no such thing as too much. And that is kind of the trial lawyer mantra in these days when we're discussing the scope of patentability. How long should copyright be good for? And their answer is, there is no such thing as too much. Like, you know, the earth could be a cinder after the sun has gone away, and we should have copyright go on for another 70 years. <laughs> right? I don't know who that's for, but uh, <laughs> uh, that would be, that would be their, their position. So this is. The maximalist scope ends up producing some pretty ridiculous uh, kinds of results, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then finally, venture capitalists. This is Ursula from The Little Mermaid. Um, she talked to Ariel and uh, made it seem like, you know, like, oh, I care for you. I want you to realize your dreams. That's actually not what happened, in case you didn't see The Little Mermaid. Um, she, uh, she was very much in her own self-interest. And venture capitalists are doing the same thing. They convince young startups, you should get lots and lots and lots of patents. Not because it's going to be so great for you to spend all that money on patents or whatever, but when your dream is dead, I can at least sell off the patents. And so this is another place where people are getting like, patents are super, super important. They're like, what they should be hearing there is, I mostly expect your thing to fail, and I hope to sell off the furniture and the patents. So this is not a good place for uh, people to be getting information about how legal tools work and how they interact with software. Um, oh, random people in the, I got two of the fish. Sorry about that. Whoops, slavery office. Um, so this is an, I'm not sure why, but people listen to random folks on the internet. I used to underestimate this group until the last election, but uh, not anymore. Um, and uh, apparently, they have opinions also about copyleft, free software legal tools, what the scope of patentability should be. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to lower your IQ any day, go looking for people talking about legal tools on Slashdot. Um, lots of lots of stuff there. Um, I used to when I used to work at the FSF, like people would call me up and try and get me to give them legal advice over the phone. People, it's, it's kind of, it's weird. It's like a, they think like legal advice is some street drug. If you could just trick people into giving it to you, you don't have to pay as much for it. It's not like that. Um, and then finally, there are other kinds of opportunists. There are um, companies that think they see an angle here. They're like, they're, they come to our community and they're like, oh, look at all these little kids making software with their hippy dippy licenses. And they think they're just going to like roll up and take it and go away, and there won't be any consequences. So um, this, you know, obviously there are still rules. <laughs> so now that we're convinced that we need to craft our own message and not let random people on the internet and other bad actors do it for us, how do we do that? So um, it's kind of two parts. Uh, 
One, we need to be able to convey the facts properly. And then two, we also um, need to be able to convey what is good behavior and what is bad behavior. Here is where we are right now. This is, um, <laughs> this is a church in a man-made lake. Uh, they definitely removed the bells, but the townspeople will all tell you that they hear them on spooky nights and things like that. Um, and there's a lot going on below the surface. So a lot of people who come to our shores here in Free Software are, have seen this. They have no idea what's going on below the surface. It's up to us to fill that in. Um, and uh, for many folks, uh, Mohawks and free software are brand new, um, but they're not new to everyone. So I feel like this critical piece of context is something that we can provide. Just because you've only just read about the GPL doesn't mean that it is brand new. Obviously, everyone in this room knows, knows that, but um, there are definitely more traditional companies that uh, you know are actually kind of new to software and are new to our things, and so. You know, when they come here, they're like, oh, I heard about this new license. And it's like, um, yeah, the GPL is not actually new. Free software is 30 years old or so. Um, you know, it's, I think it behooves us to provide that context that, like, one, it's been around for a really long time. And then, two, it's probably not going anywhere. And so that, I think, will give it a, a different gravity than, like, tell me about this newfangled free software thing. Um, and so I think it, it's, it uh, behooves us to provide that context. Um, and then, do you guys uh, know what printer this is? <laughs> okay, one. <laughs> it is, it is. Um, so the second thing I think about crafting our message is that um, we want to tell stories. This is the printer uh, that uh, RMS writes about in Free Software, Free Society. In case you were wondering what it looked like, it's big, right? Um, you could probably fit like a family of four in there. but. Um, I'm glad we don't have printers like that anymore. But he made a, you know, he told a story about a printer that captured people's imagination. So when I tell you that we can craft a story that makes free software interesting, I think we can do it, right? Printers are not inherently interesting, right? Um, I mean, maybe if you work at HP, I don't know. But so one thing that I would say is that part of that story has to be that, so we've got copyright, but a lot of different entities have added to and embroidered upon the idea of copyright uh, with different kinds of legal tools. And I think it's interesting to think about what the motive for those different types of additions to copyright are. So like the DMCA, uh, the goal here is actually not to like help the world or give stuff away or be a nice person. It's kind of to force people to give you money for stuff that they didn't used to have to give you money for. Um, it, you know, and I, I could do a whole talk on how I feel like we're hurtling towards this situation where people are obligated to buy stuff. Um, you know, but that's, that is actually a whole other talk. So, so this is like adds, this is an attempt to update copyright, but it's, I don't think that it's for, uh, for a good reason. It's, um, you know, it's for commercial interest to the, uh, to the consumer's detriment. If we could balance that, it would be okay. I'm not opposed to people making money. Like, you know, I like a big platter of sushi as much as the next person who likes a big platter of sushi, I guess. But um, this, you see, um, where commercial interests are being balanced against free speech. And so this is another place where we've tried to like, how do we update copyright? This is, um, Sintel is from the Blender Foundation. It's like a completely free software, open source. Like everything is, is licensed Creative Commons. And um, it twigs something for Sony Pictures and they uh, send an automatic takedown notice. Whoops. Uh, but I think this is really telling about like overreach um, and how, uh, how that overreach can be really ridiculous. So, you know, so we can we can talk about the way that we interact, ways that we interact with copyright that feel wrong, ways that feel ridiculous, um, and um, and talk about like what we might do instead. Uh, Cory Doctorow likes to talk about copyleft as the software licensing equivalent of not buying cookies at the store, so that later when you're really hungry and you want to eat all the cookies, you've already 
behooved yourself to the community and said, we're all going to act in the community's interest as opposed to um, you know, sell it off at the exclusion of the rest of the group, if that, um, if that makes sense. Maybe you don't crave cookies in the middle of the night. But. Um, so patents, um, again, we can, we can make it look ridiculous. Apple has a design patent on rounded corners. This is a tablet, an actual tablet um, as well, from the uh, Assyrian uh, Empire. So like the, the idea that they would try and have a patent on that is ridiculous, and they should be mocked. Uh, this is fog, um, which I couldn't figure out how to picture out some of the really vaguely written patents, but I think it's important to talk about how ridiculous they are and mock things like the file allocation table patent. Or um, there's a patent on the, did you mean to attach a file to email when you uh, have forgotten, you know, and it has the word attachment in it? I don't know if that was granted, but it was definitely applied for. Um, and then, uh, so silly, ridiculous. And then this one is actually just evil. This is not a patent, this is a copier. But um, there was a company uh, uh, troll that sued a nonprofit in Vermont for uh, image processing patents, and they wanted money from everyone who used their copier. They're a nonprofit that serves. Uh, like unemployed people who want to make copies of their resume, it would have sunk them to pay $1,000 a pop. So when we talk about like why we are really passionate about these legal tools, it's because we want to stop evil. We want to get rid of the silliness. We want to get rid of the ridiculous and frivolous patents. So sharing in a patent world, uh, we've written patent clauses. I, like I said, I work at the Open Invention Network, the DPL. Lot. These are all to en enable sharing, and I think that's the story that we want to tell. So again, um, organizing people where they're at, you want to um, understand that not everybody knows everything. Uh, only, not even Bradley Kuhn left the womb knowing about copyleft, right? <laughs> so you have to ask questions to figure out where people are at. Um, they might be concerned about security. Many eyes make shallow bugs. It's a great argument. Um, maybe uh, promoting their company. Being a good actor in our space and not coming late to the party and screwing it up is a great way to put your company out there. Uh, and then uh, efficiency, having clear uh, ass assignation policies so like people know how to give you their code is going to be good. Uh, so sharing our code, I think it's also important for us to talk about when you have crossed the line, what is not OK. Free software is more like bowling than mom. Uh, if you think you're a disruptor, like because you've come here to like with a clever hack to steal code or whatever, you're not. And and we need to say that that needs to be part of our message. I think you don't have to use these words. You can use your own voice. I understand not everyone wants to call someone a jerk. Uh, lawsuits don't make friends, and people remember. So if your company is like, cool, I found all these like kids making software with this hippie license, and then you sue everyone for short-term gain, guess what? They're not going to want to come work at your company. Uh, if you want more on how to not show up as a disruptor jerk, um, Vicky Brasseur has a great talk on this. So in conclusion, um, our messaging is here in the murky, watery depths right now. And I want to see us come into the light and uh, you know, have people see us working, have, us, have them see what we're doing, have us explain why we're doing it, you know, get them to come along with us, take them fishing maybe, I don't know. Um, if you, one solid piece that you could come and uh, help us as far as like creating better documentation is to work on the Beyond Licensing Working Group at the Open Source Initiative. I have picture credits, of course. And then I would be happy to take whatever questions we have time for. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions? End of the day. It's totally fine if we don't have questions. <laughs> or people can send me. I know sometimes with legal topics, like, you know, I'd be like, my friend's company, blah, blah. Like, it's fine. You can contact me directly as well. Well, I feel like I have to come up with a question. If no one okay. Asks a question. Um, <clears throat> how would you compare the different uh, patent groups like OEN and LOT and DPL? I don't know much about DPL. Mm. Maybe could you say a word about those? 
Yeah, so the Open Invention Network is a uh, defensive patent pool. Everyone signs an agreement not to sue each other within the pool, and it's focused on Linux, GNU, Android, and that kind of stuff. Um, the license on transfer network is intended to uh, make it unappealing to sell patents to a troll, which is defined by a company that gets more 50% or more of their revenue from uh, patent aggression. Um, and so that's, that's a, uh, an additional um, contract that follows that patent around. And then the DPL is the defensive patent license, which didn't have a lot of uptake, but um, they're still tinkering with it. Uh, it's intended to kind of mirror the GPL but be for licen like for licensing patents. So. So um, that was quite entertaining, but um, uh, the point was that you, you were suggesting that we don't make that message very well, but surely that's what you said is exactly what any of us would say, and is that not already the message people give? I mean, maybe it's not received everywhere because some people have just turned up, but I don't see a lot of people give, not giving those sensible messages. I think it's more that it needs to be intentional. I, I think that when we're called upon to do it, uh, we probably do a good job, but that um, maybe we're like, oh, just use this software, and then if we could take another minute. I'm saying we should be more proactive. Yeah. yeah. So um, that's, that's, that's kind of what I would like to see us do. <laughs> right, or you could join me on the Beyond Licensing Work Group so that we could document some of this stuff, and then, then instead of doing it over and over again, you could just point people to this amazing resource which we have to still build. What, what, will, what will Beyond Licensing become as a resource? What's the goal? Well, so far, it's a wiki of uh, ideas around best practices for using free and open source software and using the free and open source software legal tools. So, yeah. All right. Well, cool. One more talk from our friend Simon Phipps. So, All right. Thank you very much, Deb.